All right, so just to respect everyone's time, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, as I mentioned, everyone is in listen-only mode, um, so you don't have to worry about muting yourself. You are already muted. Um, so welcome to uh, Moving Forward, Finding Our Strength and Resilience during COVID-19 uh, Q&A se session with Dr. Annie Lewis O'Connor. Uh, let's see, so today we are going to, uh, let's just go through some housekeeping items to get started. Um, if you have any questions for the presenter, please do enter that in the Q&A uh, portion of, of your Zoom menu. Um, the chat box can be used as you are right now to kind of sharing where you're from, uh, which we really encourage everyone to do so. Um, and also if there's any issues with the webinar or if you have questions for the panelists, uh, go ahead and, and uh, enter those in the Zoom, Zoom chat. Um, any handouts, certificates, recordings, um, and other resources will be emailed to everyone within the next week, um, hopefully within the next 40, 24 to 48 hours, but just in case we like to promise um, um, you know, a week or less. And if you are just calling in, I know we have a few call in attendees, please do email me at ashley at domesticshelters.org um, to share where you're from so that way we can, or excuse me, share the email address where we can send that information since that will not appear in our attendee report. Okay, and just a couple reminders to get started about who domesticshelters.org is. Um, we are the fastest growing online resource for domestic violence information. We help over 3 million people each year. And uh, we do have a searchable database of over 2,800 domestic violence programs in the US and Canada. Uh, and if you're not sure if your organization has claimed and updated your listing, please contact me at ashley at domesticshelters.org. And finally, our U.S. shelters can set up a free wish list, which allows donors from anywhere in the world to ship items directly to your shelter. Um, all you have to do is get that set up and I can help you get started. Um, just like I said, send me an email. All right, so the flow for today, uh, we're going to have we have some pre-submitted questions. So I sent out an email a few days ago just kind of asking for questions. So we went ahead and, and compiled those. Um, and then additional questions, if we have time, will be answered in the Q&A box. Um, Dr. Lewis O'Connell has, has gratefully or graciously offered to answer any additional questions in an email form afterwards, assuming um, you know, we don't have too many, we'll kind of whittle those down and send out a follow-up email with any questions that we did not get answered today. Um, and then if time permits, we do have some questions for attendees um, that are um, kind of, we got some questions that we're asking for crowdsourcing kind of information about what people are doing. Um, so we'll um, get to those if we have time today. All right, so I'll go ahead and introduce our, our expert presenter today, uh, Dr. Annie Lewis O'Connor. Uh, she's the founder and director of the Care Clinic at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, Dr. Lewis O'Connor is a board certified pediatric and OBGYN nurse practitioner and a uh, sexual assault nurse examiner. For eight years, she has served as co chairs of the Partners Healthcare Trauma Informed Care Initiative. Uh, she is the principal investigator on a, a Department of Excuse me, Department of Justice grant uh, exploring interventions for victims of crime in hospital based programs. Annie has numerous peer reviewed publications and book chapters. Uh, she holds a faculty appointment at Harvard Medical School. Um, so let me go ahead and unmute our presenter today. Hi, Dr. Lewis O'Connor. How are you doing today? I'm great. Hello, everyone. All right. I feel like I just talked a whole lot. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. And um, yeah, just we'll get started. I'll pull up your first slide. I know you have some information you wanted to share. So I'll, I'll let you jump in. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's so nice to see um, representation from across our country. Um, I do hope um, that you and yours are, are all thriving well during these um, unprecedented times, and um, I look forward to the next hour with you. Um, I sort of put this up. I, I would imagine that many of you are familiar with trauma-informed care, um, and I'm actually trying to operationalize um, how we apply these six principles. Um, and as many of you may know, th this works for school systems, law enforcement, hospitals, clinics, um, really any kind of an organization. I'm one that really believes that if we did everything in a trauma-informed manner in this country, um, we would be in a much better place. Um, so I put the six principles up and 
oftentimes I'm challenged in thinking about, is that just good care? You know, like listening to our clients, listening to our patients. To me, that's good care. What makes it trauma informed? And so here on this slide, you'll see that I've, um, I've kind of given some examples. Um, I think right now, um, and I've been doing a lot of debriefings um, at my hospital for nurses that were deployed um, in front facing clinicians that um, were, you know, doing anywhere from 12 to 14 hour shifts taking care of COVID patients. Um, and what I'm hearing is that many just don't feel safe. Um, physically, um, they're, they're concerned about the virus still, and psychologically, many are um, challenged um, with sort of moral injury um, and, and burnout. Um, and I, I, I'm well aware of what you all do. I want you to all know I sit on the board of Casamirna here in Massachusetts and have been a board member for 10 years, so I'm quite familiar with what you do. Um, and there was actually a time early in my career where I left nursing for a while and I was a domestic violence advocate. So um, what you do is near and dear to my heart. And I, I think about the clinic that I started eight years ago and I started that to really um, help enhance, if you will, the services that medical providers um, provide to, to people that have been impacted by trauma, violence and abuse. So I don't wanna go through all of this because you guys got great questions and I wanna make sure we get to them. Um, some of them are provocative questions too where you can um, maybe just challenge yourself in thinking about it. I'm spending a lot of time on that safety um, principle right now and I'm also spending a great deal of time on cultural, historical and gender acknowledgement um, and how we can become more equitable in the services we provide, how we think about those with an equity lens um, and, and how we really move forward with the anti-racist um, programs. Um, and if we do that, then we Um, society. So I hope this is somewhat helpful. I'm going to move into the questions. It says I'm muted. Um, okay, now I'm unmuted. Okay, am I, you all hear me? <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. That was that was my fault. So you're good to okay. go. Okay, so go ahead, Ash. You're going to read the questions. All right, so the first question is, I would love any information on symptoms and spread of COVID-19. We are a small communal shelter, so those facts are important. Um, okay, this could take a great deal of time, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna give you the down and dirty, um, which is I would really encourage you folks to have partners in your community from the medical system whether it's an infectious disease person, whether it's a, a nurse that's well versed on it. I certainly have been in this space since March 8th. Um, the signs and symptoms um, are posted on the CDC website. Also, I think your departments of public health in your you know, um, respective states should be publishing that information. And I do wanna say that I saw many patients that did not have the classical symptoms um, we learned uh, three weeks into it that loss of smell was a symptom. Um, so I would encourage you to seek out that information and build some partnership with folks at your local hospitals um, so that you can get those questions answered real time. I'll take the next question. All right. So question number two, uh, when sheltering, what supplies would the client need? So masks, sanitizers, gloves, et cetera, and how do we properly use them? Yeah, good question. Um, yes, I think we are looking at um, being in the mask phase for quite some time. Um, as you all probably are aware, this is a, a, a disease that is spread respiratory, or we call it aerosolized, when we talk, when we laugh hard, when we sneeze, our sputum becomes aerosolized, and that is how this disease spreads. So wearing those masks, you're actually protecting others from you, um, as well as you provide the opportunity to protect your mouth so that nothing sort of gets in or up your nose. Sanitizing your hands is, is crit critical. And quite frankly, we should have been doing this long ago. I think we'll see a drop in the flu rate if we see some of this um, mm -hmm. done. If you are going to wear gloves, you, you know, I see people out at the markets with them and I would encourage them not to do that. I think that it gives you a false sense of protection. Um, I think good hand washing and keeping your hands away from your eyes, your nose and your mouth 
is really the best practice here um, for hygiene. When you do take the mask off, I do encourage you to use the straps on the sides. You don't want to touch the front of the mask because that's considered dirty. Um, so when you take it off, you need to take it off with the strings. Um, I think if you Google proper use of wearing face masks, I've seen some really good um, YouTube vid videos and things out there. So I have a, a thought, um, mm -hmm. Annie. I just I just recently read how um, toilets can. Um, uh, sort of explode um, germs into the air. Uh, and so if your shelter has seats that you can close after each use, it might help to um, uh, reduce the dispersion after people use the restrooms. Um, hmm. uh, so uh, I think that it's important that we, that we use every strategy we can um, yep. to reduce these, these um, um, sharing um, opportunities that are just around us right now and and I think you know the question is um, what supplies would the clients need I would say whatever you're using to keep yourself safe um, make it available to the to to the people that you serve as well because I think it's really important um, mm -hmm. uh, that that we uh, look at the equality of access to resources and mm -hmm. and that's in shelter as well as in the community so um, having worked in shelters for over 10 years when I first started this work um, here in Colorado, um, I really, I really feel like we have to keep, keep asking ourselves that questions. What do we need to make sure that everyone in, in our facility has access to these resources? Um, mm -hmm. And, and how do I get my community to support them if I need more money? So you all are doing great work. Thank you so much. But um, you can do this. I know you can. <laughs> And if you don't have sanitizer, good warm soapy water works really well too. <laughs> Great. Mm -hmm. okay. Move on to the next one. Sure thing. All right, question three. Um, should we continue to take temps daily of staff and students? Yeah, great question. I'm kind of all over the place um, with this. I can tell you from my, my experience since March 8th um, that we've had many um, patients present with no temps. Um, I do think it's important. I think self-monitoring is important. Um, and if you feel like you're running a temp, many places are doing it. Um, it's not going to hurt. It doesn't hurt to take a temperature. It's not invasive. Um, however, I think the self-monitoring piece is really important. So if you have a checklist, I have to, before I go to the hospital every day, I have to go on a little app. I have to check off that I have no symptoms. My nose isn't running. I don't have a new cough. Um, I, I'm not running a temperature. I don't have body aches. Um, so I just attest to the fact that I've done a self-assessment of myself and that I have no symptoms. And I, I actually think it's a good strategy. I, I actually had some symptoms a few weeks ago, um, but they're allergy related. <laughs> um, so it, it just makes you stop and pause and think about yourself. We were so busy taking care of others. We need to think of ourselves as well. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Question number four is a little bit longer. Um, I know that all client medical information is confidential, but in shelter living, the clients will notice the client with COVID not coming out of the room and getting food and water being given to them by our staff. Um, how do we handle the fears that this may cause for others if we can't share any information at all? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. Um, so I think that, you know, you have to be, have a general statement that basically we, um, we believe in the rights of people to share as much or as little as they want. Um, if a particular client is willing to share, that's fine. But um, given that it's health related, um, our philosophy is that we protect the private rights of people to hold their own medical information. Um, yeah, it's kind of a, a giveaway if somebody is confined to their room for either a, a rule out COVID or is recovering from COVID. Um, but, you know, we all have these fears, right? I mean, I have fear every day that I go into the hospital or that I encounter people. I think it's inherent in a virus that we don't understand as well as um, we want to at this point. So I think it's mutual respect and understanding and kindness towards people um, and um, respecting the rights of people to hold their own information and share what they're, they feel they're comfortable doing. Great. All right. Next question. Okay. So this was one 
as uh, <laughs> some professionals are recommending vitamin C and zinc. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> Well, you're asking that question to the person that takes vitamin C and zinc every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I actually have taken multivitamins, um, vitamin C, D, and zinc um, since the beginning of COVID. I am a believer that supplemental vitamin intakes um, are helpful. Um, I don't know if we have any randomized control trials on it. Um, and maybe it's just a placebo effect, but I feel that um, during COVID and working numerous hours nonstop, um, I keep telling my colleagues, I swear it's the vitamin <laughs> C, zinc, and my multivitamin that has kept me strong. So there is certainly no harm in doing it. Um, and um, there is some literature that shows that supplemental vitamin intake does boost the immune system. And that's, I think uh, that's a critical piece um, uh, for you all to remember is that the job you do is really high stress already. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're in an environment where we have a health crisis. Um, you're dealing with crisis every day, trying to keep your community safe. And we have a, um, a social justice equality crisis going on on top of that. So we're being impacted on so many different levels uh, right now in this country by things that can in fact um, depress our immune system. So anything you can do to yeah. boost it up a little bit, vitamin C, zinc, and D, you know, I take those too, Annie. Um, <laughs> so I think that that's, that's an important piece that you can add at relatively low cost uh, as something that you can offer um, your staff and, and uh, uh, people that you serve at house um, to help to help just up the the odds a little better in their favor. So do that. That that would be an easy one, I think. And I I particularly like the gummies. <laughs> <laughs> I like the gummy version. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to the next question then. Uh, question number six: uh, How do we support the women we work with while dealing with our own fear? Mm -hmm. uh, balancing our work and self-care is always necessary, but even more so now. And I'm struggling with that. So, kind of tying into our last question. Uh, I so respect that, and I, I think the first thing is like putting it right out there, right? Um, I, I will say that as I'm doing these debriefings now with the nursing staff at my hospital, um, I, you know, I wish we, if we had this to do over, I would have put these support mechanisms in place earlier. You know, we're doing these campfires where we're all gathering, talking about um, not only the challenges they faced and where the opportunities could be if we were in this situation in, in September, October, but what were the strengths? And, and, and I have a lot of great stories to share. I, I have a lot of challenges I faced, but I have a lot of great stories. I think your word in there, balancing, is really critical. And I would encourage all of you to, if you keep a calendar or how you plan your week, to make sure you write in, you know, I'm going to take a walk. I'm going to connect with a friend. I mean, I'm not one to uh, support the word social distancing. I think we need to socially connect while using physical distancing. Um, so, I, you know, be proactive in it. Don't wait for yourself to hit the wall. Think about it now. I mean, if you're in that spot now, think about what do you do to lift yourself up? Who are your resources? Um, and how can you Balance your day so you get some of that time in every day, whether it's meditation or yoga or reading or calling a friend, but be proactive. Really think about it because these are, these are really unusual times and I've had my struggles as well. So I respect that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Question number seven, uh, how to plan with women when the future is so uncertain? Mm -hmm. You have, to far, you have to focus on some of the positivity because you could go down that rabbit hole and never come out. Um, so I, I always try to reframe things. Um, I'm doing that with many of my patients right now that feel the same, the same thing. Um, I think we have to just really try to focus and balance that conversation with what are the positive things? What are the strengths? Who are your resources? Um, what do you aspire to do? I mean, I think many of us on this call have children. Um, are they going back to school? Are they not? Um, you can take all the negative of what's happening right now, but let's look at some of the positivity and there's a lot of good things. I, I went through Dunkin' Donuts the other day and, and the person in front of me paid for my cup of tea. <laughs> I just thought, you know, think about that because if you just look at all the negativity in the world right now, it's a very, it looks like a very doomy, gloomy place. 
Um, however, there's a lot of good things happening and the work that you are all doing, and I know because I had a board meeting last night with Casamirna, it's good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff happening. Don't lose sight of that and don't let them lose sight of that. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add here. Um, so we have, we have, as a country, um, as a world, we have gone through some really difficult times um, in the past, whether it's been... Um, you know, the Great Depression or um, World War One and Two or um, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Women's Movement. We, we've, we've found ourselves up against walls uh, in a lot of different ways, different communities trying to get themselves heard, seen, valued um, in different ways um, over the course of the life of this country. And so what I say is take the long view. Um, uh, because a lot, a lot of times, the work you do on a daily basis is working with people whose future is, is so uncertain. They have no idea if they're going to be able to stay out of, away from the violent um, uh, person who's tracking them. They have no um, ability to, um, to, to guarantee that the steps they're taking are going to work, and, and neither do you. And so a lot of our work has always been uncertain. I'm going to do today what I know how to do today as an advocate, and I'm going to help that person make plans as much as possible to get the outcome we're all looking for, but we don't know that that's going to happen. But we can't stop, and we haven't stopped. Um, and, we, and we plow through the times when we have um, overwhelming grief because the choices um, that an abuser made um, undid everything we tried to do. So, so understand that about yourselves. You're resilient. You come back to work every day knowing that you don't have a guaranteed outcome of the work you do, but that that moment in time you're making a difference in somebody's life. Stay in that space um, because we'll get through this. We'll get through this, to, but, but we'll do it together. And so from, from the last conversation around uh, individuals struggling, stay connected and stay strong that that has what has been the foundation of this work and the, and the way that this work has moved forward at the rapid speed it has mm. together we are a powerful powerful force so you know pay attention to what's happening not just in the in in the in the shelter residence but in your staff office who needs help who needs shoring up who needs to take a time out um, mm. do that for each other as well as you do for the for the people who are um, in danger Hmm. That's great, Rita. And I think if you, you know, back to my very first slide on trauma-informed care, you'll see that one of the guiding principles is peer support. Um, so how are you going to operationalize peer, peer support in your, um, you know, in your agency? And I, I, I've noticed that even at work, I've been paying particularly more attention to my colleagues from um, that are people of color because I know that disproportionately in Boston, those communities were much harder hit by by COVID. Um, so that peer support piece, um, which reader I think you're getting at there, is absolutely critical. And in, in spend time thinking about how are we going to support each other through this, without judgment. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Question number eight. Um, if we go back in the fall and the virus becomes worse, what steps can we take to protect victims in shelter? Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm listening to the experts um, at the CDC and within my institution. Um, we have a number of infectious disease doctors that are in the labs working to create a vaccine um, and antibody testing. So I get to participate and, and learn from all of, you know, some incredible experts in this country. Um, I don't think it would be much different. I, I think what will be different is now we, we kind, we're learning how to treat it better. We're learning how to control it. Um, and that's where we may end up back. Um, you know, you have to be in tune with what's happening in your state. Um, Boston was a hot spot. Um, we were not as, you know, in the situation that New York was in, but I think many of us have all learned from that. And certainly the um, physical distancing really helped us to curtail and control the virus. So, um, if the virus resurges in the fall, we will be that much more knowledgeable. And I think we will go back to probably um, all these things that are being loosened up right now. We may have to call, you know, call us back to stay at home orders. 
Um, it will depend. It will depend on what state you're in and what your numbers are looking like. Um, remember, the goal for us is to get to herd immunity. And herd immunity is sort of where we got with polio and measles when you have at least 80% of the population um, that um, is protected and it has antibodies to the virus. So we still have a ways to go and it's a good question. Let's be optimistic um, and let's hope that when the fall comes, um, we won't see that big surge again. Great, all right, question number nine. Uh, I know that all client medical information is confidential Oh, you know what? I think I repeated this one, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, let's move on to the next question and it sounds like we'll have some extra time. A little deja vu here. All right, let's go to number 10. And this is a longer question, but I want to keep it all in there because there was a lot of context and I think uh, people will kind of identify with that. So let me uh, read, this, read through this, so bear with me. Um, so an issue we face in our shelter is about the limits shelters have to impose on women in order to make it feel safe under our health regulations. Mm -hmm. The women no longer have free access to the kitchen and making their own meals. As hard as staff have tried to accommodate, it has been challenging for the women. Uh, we have also had restrictions on them going out and being out in the community with others and getting exposed to COVID. Mm -hmm. All this goes against our philosophy and beliefs while we are doing great work, we are having issues feeling like we are adding to their trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk to them about the big picture and the health of everyone involved, which helps. Um, we explore the individual needs and accommodate as much as possible. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I go right back to those TIC principles in collaboration um, and empowerment, voice and choice are two of the principles. Um, so I think within each one of your shelters, you just need to be you know, transparent and have a discussion. Um, so not having free access to the ki kitchen, can that really be changed? to that we're gonna have a schedule. Some people are early morning risers, other people like to sleep in. Can you make it so that there is never more than two people um, is, is what we've been saying for most of the shelters. Um, um, Ashley, did you send them sort of that Q&A that I had done for um, an EDV? Because many of these questions came up and we answered. Because yeah. um, I'm happy to share that. That's a, that's a, you know, a, a document that's in the cloud and is out there. Sure, um, yeah. I hadn't sent that in advance, but I plan on following up with that. So. Oh, great. Great. That's okay. I'll, I'll include that in the additional resources. Yeah. And then we can answer the other questions. But I think you have to be, you know, we have to use a lot of common sense. I, you know, even within my family and, and my friend network, we're just having these open, transparent conversations um, to figure out where, you know, to find the sort of the, the sweet zone, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that maybe not free access to the kitchen, but, you know, we're going to have to work together because we're all here and we don't want more than two people in the kitchen at one time. And then when those two people leave, you just wipe down the hard surfaces. So I think it's a back and forth and not to them or for them, but with them. Um, because I think if they're part of, of figuring out what the solutions are and, and the ways to keep everybody safe, that you'll be much more successful and minimize the trauma. The other thing I would uh, add to that is um, mm. I think that the things that we are implementing right now may feel less empowering. Um, yeah. And so what I want advocates to think about is if you're overall focus on doing your work is about empowering and self-actualization and supporting people um, with information so that they're making the choices that are best for them. Look at this as a very temporary adjustment to that and don't get set into a routine that will actualize these things in your mm. system in a way that goes forward beyond when we need to have them go forward. We don't want the virus to change us. We want us to mitigate the impact the virus has on us and continue to do our work with the foundational belief system um, that we have in currently in shelter. So, um, so if your shelter is about feminist equality, um, uh, uh, dealing with oppressions, uh, in addition to reducing violence in our community, then only let the, the virus change the things you absolutely have to to keep people safe. And, and do that with the understanding that this is temporary. These are not things we normally have implemented here um, and that we will go back to a, a more open 
environment when we can safely do that for everyone. And keep saying that to yourselves, keep putting that out there so that it becomes the message and it becomes a philosophy as opposed to, to reactionary changes that then change the shelter environment that you don't want. Yeah, that, that's great, Rita. I, I love how you put that. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm going to pull, go ahead and pull another question from the bank since I repeated that one and we have a little bit of time if that's okay. Yo, fab, yeah. All terrific. right. Just give me a minute. Ashley, can I, uh, can I say that there was a question that was submitted um, oh, yeah. as well? I'm reading that out. Um, yeah. The, the one down in the Q&A section. Yeah. Do you mind sharing that with the group? That way everyone can, can hear the answer. Because sure. um, I thought we could answer it. Um, and Annie, I'd love your thoughts on this. So, um, so this is from someone who's anonymous <laughs> and I, I go with your sister. I know what that's like. Uh, what are your thoughts on high risk staff members returning to work as long as they wear masks and don't work directly with clients? Ah, it's a great question. We, we certainly were up against that as we had nurses um, that were being deployed and some had underlying medical conditions. Um, so I don't think that, you know, I'm not going to have a set answer for you, except that the autonomy of that patient, uh, that staff person is very important. And I think that that person should work with their healthcare provider um, to truly understand what the risks and benefits could be, because I don't know what the medical condition is. Um, um, and, and so that makes it a little bit harder. But we took many of our nurses that did have underlying um, illnesses or you know high risk conditions um, and we deploy them to areas to minimize those risks so if there is an opportunity obviously to keep this person employed and working and part of the team in a in a position that removes her from um, added risks and then that is i think the right thing to do um, again, it's an open, transparent discussion um, where, you know, she is heard and um, I think um, mitigating her anxiety will be really important so um, that she still feels that she's a productive member of the team. Does that help? I think that was a helpful answer for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I will encourage everyone, if you have any additional questions that have popped up in your, in your head as, as you've listened to the presentation today, please do go ahead and enter those in the Q&A section. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and read one of the additional questions that came in via email that did not um, get included in the presentation. Um, mm -hmm. So this question is, um, and I'll try my best to, let's see, so I am very interested in helping clients stay safer at home uh, during this time when sheltering is much more difficult and maybe unsafe due to COVID. So some examples are some, maybe some de-escalation techniques or mm -hmm. um, ways to kind of keep their strength up um, and just creative ways of reaching out, doing errands, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. So how can, how can people stay safer at home um, when, when there's abuse going on? Oh, that's, that, that's great. And we've been doing some work in that space, um, utilizing telehealth. Um, and I'm happy to send that along to you too, actually. We worked okay. on a, um, you know, um, IPV inquiry, which we actually decided was going to be universal education um, for telehealth visits. So I'll, I'll send that algorithm along. Um, I think it is harms reduction. Um, and I think it's, you know, thinking the strategies to, to with that individual around decreasing harm. So um, and increasing engagement with others, which doesn't always mean, you know, um, you know, it has to be physical. Um, and, and so I think having these safety plans um, in place, um, when you have an opportunity to, to think about it, I, I saw something come out of the UK, some of you might have seen it too, um, where like on a telehealth type of encounter, that if a, um, a woman puts up her hand, crosses her thumb over the middle of her palm and puts her fingers over it, she's signaling. Um, that she's in trouble. So my question, and I actually um, have a call with the person that um, wrote this article to say, well, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> um, is establishing that. So, you know, to have a, a client established with maybe her sister or, you know, and when I do that, when I signal you, it means I need you to come over. Um, I need you to call me and um, interrupt. Um, I, I, I need to go take a walk with you. 
Um, I think some of the signaling stuff could be really interesting um, given the times that we're in. And I'm also curious if any of you on the call um, have used some of those strategies and if you might want to share them. Great, yeah, please do and encourage everyone to uh, add to the chat if you have anything that you'd like to share on that. So Ashley, I want to add, add a, uh, something here kind of um, uh, before I forget it, which is that uh, as I was looking at some of the additional questions, one of the questions was how do I, how do I get information from what other states are doing um, because it, there's not a lot of uh, cross state sharing in terms of how people are dealing with this. And I think that that's, um, I'd like to encourage people um, to, to contact their state coalition and find out if their state coalition is kind of aggregating information for you as programs within your state mm -hmm. to share with each other because you all may have different strategies that are working for you and other people may not have thought of them. Um, and there was a question that came up on the um, uh, two other panelists that I think is important about um, finding additional resources for children because now they no longer have access because they're not in school and they're not in those systems where that might during the day have helped them. So I think those are the kind of things that can help you all share with each other. You know, the foundation of this work uh, when we started it back in the uh, late 70s was, a, was really creating um, a network which mm -hmm. became the national and state coalitions um, in ways in which to share information as programs started to open and, and, and do work in areas that had never had these resources before. Um, that, that collaborative um, sharing, networking kind of energy, uh, we've gotten away from a little bit, I think, in terms of this work. And this may be the perfect time for us to re-energize that thinking, mm -hmm. uh, to, to be more collectively engaging with each other and sharing information with each other and um, supporting each other because these are unique times. And it got us a really long way down the road um, um, in terms of the way that we strategized and thought and worked and sometimes struggled together. Um, so do that with each other. Um, one of the things that um, I would like domestic shelters to offer is that, um, that if your state is aggregating that kind of information for you all together, let us know, uh, send that to Ashley, um, and then we'll start putting that back out to you all so you know which states have these resources and are talking um, with each other and have them up for you to go to kind of go and look for different ideas that you may not be implementing right now in your states. So we can offer that, I think, as a way to, to get information back out to you as um, how you're doing this work together um, and, and how we can spread that more nationally and even into the, ter the U.S. territories um, um, mm. and other countries that may be even in engaging with us at this because I saw uh, some information about Canada and Nigeria being on the call as well. So, um, so I wanna, want us to be the kind of resource that can help everybody um, everywhere and you all have the information, share it with us and we'll get it back out to the broader population. Great, thank you yeah. so much, Rita. And just, again, my email address is just ashley at domesticshelters.org. So we do encourage you to send, send over um, your information if whether or not your coalition is aggregating information. Um, we did have one other Q&A question come in. Um, it's maybe a little bit of repeating some information, but I think there's just a need for what is that, what is the most important thing that they can do to help spread, uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19? Yeah. I, I think the biggest thing is keeping your hands away from your face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I really do. Um, you know, it's 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 the way that many different diseases get spread. Like we touch something and then we rub our eyes, or we touch our nose or mouth. Um, those mucous membranes are are really just a, a reservoir for introducing um, germs into the body. So I'd actually say that's number one. Number two is definitely wearing your mask and keep the physical distancing, which doesn't mean, you know, you can't, you, you can't see certain people, but have an open dialogue about where all those people have been and, you know, stay out of crowds. Um, mm -hmm. I think we are going to see you and we're seeing numbers go up in 16 states right now. There was a lot of protests. There are a lot of people without masks yelling and screaming. Um, and some of those people are asymptomatic positive COVID patients um, or people carrying COVID. So um, the mass, 
physical distancing and really good hand washing, keeping your um, hands away from your face. I think there's data coming out that's showing that, you know, the Amazon boxes that we were all washing down and um, letting them sit out um, overnight and stuff that um, we don't, they, they're now saying that we don't think the spread um, on, um, you know, on hot services such as that are, you know, that we don't have to be as diligent as we were in the beginning. Um, obviously, if you got a package that came to your house, it was looking wet on the outside or something like that, you know, be cautious. Um, we, you know, we're still trying to understand how long does this live on a surface? Um, I think like going up escalators and stuff, I've been in the habit now of just keeping my hands by myself, you know, to myself. Um, I don't want to put my hands on an escalator where everybody else's hands were. And if somebody sneezed into their hand, then put their hand on the escalator and I got on right after them. Um, so we'll have more information coming out. I think it's really important to watch the CDC website and also your local public health um, department is, is pulling all that information together. And I can't imagine that in every state um, that's represented on this call that your public health department is not front and center on this. Yeah. Wonderful. And um, encouraging everyone again, if you have a question, please enter in the Q&A uh, section of the Zoom chat. Uh, I did have one other, qu other question that was actually emailed in that, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize, was not included in the slides, um, but what role does resiliency play in recovery? Oh, it's huge. Yeah. You know, so as we think about psychological first aid and people recovering, um, most people can bend during, um, you know, traumatic events such as this. Um, I've had some training through the Red Cross and I um, am a, um, responded to disaster areas and went to Katrina and, and, and Haiti. And what they did is some pre-work with us up front. Um, I wish in this COVID epidemic that we had thought to employ some of that, which is psychological first aid and getting people so that they bend and they don't break. Um, and that ability to, um, to not break is really based on the resiliency within. And for some, I, I've noticed that, you know, don't do double shifts if you're feeling weak, you know, ask for time off if you feel like I just hit, you know, I'm hitting the wall. So it's really knowing where your tipping point is um, and how you can pull back and not feel guilty um, because self-care is a good thing. I, I always say to the nurses and docs I work with that taking care of yourself is the right thing to do. I want you to be the best you can be when you're here. Um, and if I look over and I see that you're not fully engaged, now I got to worry about you. So, you know, the best thing you can do um, is support each other and to know where your tipping point is and when you're feeling that. Um, and when I feel that, I, I'm very cognizant of the fact that I just need to step back and I'm replaceable. There's lots of other people that can do what I do. Um, and just know that sometimes at 24 hours away, um, from, you know, what might be a toxic environment or, or feel like it's just too much for you to take on, that's okay. I, I, you should all just say, I'm human too. Um, and so, I, you know, we all got that resiliency in us and, and you'll, you know yourself best. You know when you're getting to that point um, of no return and that's when you need to advocate for yourself um, and, and peers need to support peers during periods like that. Um, so really, resiliency is that elasticity, you know, it's that ability to bounce back um, and to be able to bend before you break. Um, and then I always encourage people that if you think you've gotten beyond a certain point, um, you need to know that there's help out there. There's, there's hotlines, there's certainly um, clinical providers. Um, you know, and know in your state, you know, um, you know, who you could reach out to. I would have that list created and, and have it posted somewhere so that if you're in that state, you don't have to go looking for it. You've got some numbers and you've got some tools in your toolbox. Rita, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, Andy, the only thing I'd add to that is that um, this, uh, this work um, has has informed me that that it, it, the levels of trauma that a body can in, incur are massive, mm. but that the human spirit is amazingly resilient. Uh, mm. The most amazing, incredible human beings I've ever met are survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. 
they taught me everything I know. Um, I am an expert because of their willingness to share that, um, that vulnerability with me. Um, so thank you for that trust um, to mm. survivors everywhere for, for giving me that information uh, so that I can help be a better advocate. Um, so the, the reality is that resiliency is sort of a core part of what our work is. How do we help people find it? How do we remind people they have it? Mm. Um, the fact that we're talking to them means that they had strategies that helped them survive the violence. And those strategies may not be useful in the future, but they sure got them to the point where they reached out for help. So honor that, respect that, and then look for, for more effective, um, longer term ways that you can continue to build your resiliency, both as an advocate and as a survivor, if, if you are one of those. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. people who have kind of come to this work from that space. So and I would just encourage people to understand that that's kind of the core part of our work. Uh, resiliency has always been part of it and us recognizing it and enforcing it and expanding it and, and supporting it is really what, um, what makes this work the most effective it can be. Mm, that's good. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we don't actually have any other Q and A um, questions queued up, so we have about ten minutes left. I would like to go into kind of the second portion since we have time, um, where we really look for some um, feedback from attendees. Um, and as I say that, we did have a question come in. Let me go ahead and read that off, and that way we can get everyone's questions answered. So the question was, how can we safely, creatively connect with children and teen survivors and offer them opportunities for social connection while maintaining physical distance? Um, in parentheses, it says, whether shelter residents or outreach clients. Um, we used to offer parents a break from active parenting time via our volunteer program, uh, which is temporarily suspended. Mm -hmm. Um, using outdoor space. I mean, I, I just see a lot of that happening, you know, within my neighborhood and, um, you know, with the warmer weather upon us, what, how can we, you know, use outdoor space to bring those kids together with masks on, um, you know, which I, I, I tell me, I, I, it breaks my heart, but it is what we need to do um, to also protect children, right? We, we saw early on that you know, this disease was in fact affecting children randomly. Um, and, you know, I would partner with sort of, you know, those that um, are ahead of this. And that, that's to Rita's earlier point is know who in your area is out there doing what and how can you all work together so you're not working as hard, you're working more efficiently. Um, so if that, I would probably, if, you know, I was trying to figure that out for myself, I'd probably, you know, reach out to some of the social workers or the child life specialists at Children's Hospital here, because I'm sure that they've been trying to figure that out. I also um, know we have a lot of teachers that are figuring that out with kids for the summer. So I think it's some upfront work to create those partnerships, but these could be partnerships you'd have forever now. Um, so I would go to the people that are, you know, already starting to think about and doing that with kids and ask how you can work together and learn from each other. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I will ask, is everyone able to see my screen still? I did get disconnected temporarily. If not, I'll go ahead and reshare my screen. Um, I think not. Okay, let's go ahead and reshare my screen and we'll start into... Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, and we did have another question come in. So we may be able to fill the rest of the time with, with questions as they're coming in. But um, so we're limited advocates in the shelter. And so um, we have limited advocates in the shelter and self care is important. Uh, but then the stress falls on the advocate on shift. So how do we respond? So when you have limited staff? Um, I kind of yeah, I hear you. So you're alone, you're saying you're on a shift and you're the only one on and you're alone on that shift. I believe so. So Alma, is that, is that answering your question? Go ahead and, and answer in the chat if you don't mind. Um, go in the chat. Let's see. So yeah, the question is, we are limited advocates in the shelter uh, and self-care is important, but the stress falls on the advocate on shift. Okay. So the advocate that's around, how do we respond? Well, I, I, a couple of things. I think you need a buddy system. Like if I had to think about 
you know, working all by myself and taking all of this on, um, that would be pretty lonely, right? Because, and we learned this at the hospital too, as people were deployed to uh, certain units, they didn't go with any of the people they knew and they went to a strange unit. Um, and in doing these deployments, we realized we're never going to do that again. Um, they needed to go with somebody that they knew and that they were familiar with. So whether that's a check-in um, that, you know, there's some sort of buddy system in place that, you know, two times during your shift, I'll text you or I'll give you a call and see how you're doing. So you don't just hold that all by yourself during a shift. Um, I think be, be proactive in thinking about what that could look like. Um, you know, and it might be that, oh, I had a great shift, so I didn't need it. But um, if you if you think about ways that if you did need that added support, where could you get it and in what format? And can you have some sort of system in place um, to operationalize that? Rita, do you have anything to add to that? Because I do think you got to build that in. I think it's really important. Yeah, I think I know that um, particularly in rural areas and on um, um, mm. Uh, uh, reservations that the number mm. of advocates, the number of uh, additional uh, support uh, staff to fill in space is very limited. So you all have to be really, really um, creative and flexible around how you deal with this, the additional stress. And depending on um, what what uh, reservation you may be on, whether it's the Navajo or the Apache reservation right now, they're just blowing up mm. um, uh, with mm. this kind of um, uh, crisis, this health crisis. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't know, maybe this is one of the times when you, when you connect with your state coalition and say, is there a way for us to help each other? Is there, you know, you know how hospitals are cross sharing staff? Is there a way for people to do that together right now to step in for each other to, to, um, to be there to be sisters and in, in, in brothers and strength right now. Um, and so I don't know if that's possible. I mean, but I think we should explore all the opportunities we have um, to be good to and kind to each other and to make sure that we um, we get through this together as healthy as we can and as mentally stable as we can. This is hard work. It's always been hard work and it's mm. so much harder now. So just give yourself that space um, to recognize it. It's harder. It is harder. What can we do to help shore each other up in some way um, and maybe be creative in the process of doing so? Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, another question did come in. I think this is one that actually I, I I have as well. Thoughts on use of hand sanitizer. Is, is there a certain alcohol percentage that is recommended? Um, I do not know what the alcohol percentage is. Um, you know, so I would have to um, research that a little bit and I could get back to you. Um, and again, I just want to reinforce that a good bacterial soap, um, you know, dial and warm water and 20 second hand washing, pick a song you like and sing it out loud while you're washing your hands. Um, has been shown to be as effective as hand sanitizer. Um, I, I would encourage, because I know many of you on this call are, are females, uh, keep those nails short. Um, I know it's nice to have long nails, but they harbor lots of bacteria and germs. Um, so it might be a good uh, opportunity to get the nails, you know, at a, at a short length. Um, we've done some studies on that at the hospital. And it really, I saw the results and I was like, okay, I guess I'm not going to have long nails anymore. I'll just keep them short. Very helpful. Thank you. If you are committed to longer nails, you must also be committed to 20 seconds with a nail brush. There we go. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, we are getting near our time. Um, I do, I guess we have five minutes. I, there was one question that kind of seems to have, um, be kind of tied into what we've been getting a lot of uh, questions about. And that would just be, let's see, which community partnerships have you leaned on during your COVID-19 response? I think that would be something if, if everyone could just, you know, turn over to the chat real quick and maybe type in a couple of suggestions to others. We'll go ahead and read those out loud. Um, that seems to be kind of a common theme around here is just where to turn for information, who to turn to for help. Um, so if everyone could just maybe take the next 60 seconds, we'll enter that in and then, then we'll wrap up here. Mm -hmm. All right, so one answer was health and human services. Mm. 
Mm. Try to keep up with these. Local health department, communicable disease nurse, health department. Um, so extra food distribution from a local resource center. So if you are, you know, seeing an increase in people coming through your doors, you know, how are we going to feed everyone? So looking for other resources for that. Um, again, the health department. You know, one oh, of the things um, that people might consider is um, some of the um, groups that work with youth, like Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, Future Farmers of America. If those, uh, if those, if the, they are looking for particular activities or ways in which to help your shelter, yeah, um, maybe having them do food drives or um, come and do an outdoor play area with, you know, with the you know, mask and distancing to, um, to give, to give your, um, uh, your residents a little more visibility with other people. I don't know, just yeah, mm. think beyond the, uh, the more um, consistent ones um, that we are looking for, because of course, your local health department is going to be key. Um, mm. uh, but, and, and the mental health and addiction counselor, those, those are the key um, providers, yeah. but think about others that who might be community supporters and might have done things for you in the past in ways that they could creatively kind of help you now. Um, because because you do you need a break too right and you need to to keep your visibility up in your community um, and with us all isolating it's harder for them to recognize the work you're doing so if there are ways that you can um, do that um, in a more visible way um, so that people remember you're there and remember that you're you're doing something to help keep people safe um, you may also see some support for yourself come up so um, mm -hmm. so think about that creatively beyond some of those mm -hmm. the standards that I see people putting up here yeah that's great and I'll go ahead and read through these because they are uh, being sent just to the panelists so um, extra food from local farmers I know that uh, no, seeing in the news a lot of farmers are not able to pick the, the crops off of their field. So maybe there's some uh, partnerships there where you can actually partner with them with food that would have been wasted otherwise. Um, let's see, mental health and addiction counselors. So reaching outside of your network of people that maybe have similar skills that can help you. Um, doing virtual support groups, that, that's a great one. I think a lot of people have turned to using this, the tool Zoom like that we're on today to host their virtual support groups. Um, public health orders and local association of women's shelters. So just reaching out to your network um, food banks, coalition of domestic violence, so local state co or state coalitions, um, grocery store deliveries, so that the, you can remain contact free. Um, those mm -hmm. are all really great suggestions. I appreciate everyone taking the time to enter those in. Um, I'd like to and, add the faith-based oh, community as well. Yes, yeah. Um, we just always seem to. It's always seems to be last on the list, um, but faith-based. And then I I know that um, I I saw it last weekend. Um, I, car washes to raise visibility of your organization. Um, you know, there's a lot of empty parking lots right now and people, um, particularly at one of the churches near me, um, offered an opportunity for the kids to have a car wash to raise money for computers for kids in the city that didn't have them. Um, so really the one thing you could really say about COVID is it's making us think um, creatively and, and using innovation. So, um, I, I like that part. I, you know, thinking way outside the box. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And that's really, I think a great positive note to end on. I'll, I'll, I'll fill in here. Um, one person did add uh, using online anxiety treatment and apps. Yeah, and the apps. Using out for technology and just really harnessing things that are already existing um, to fill in the gaps there. So um, with that, we are at our time. I'm going to go ahead and push forward a couple of slides just so I can make sure I have all my reminders. Um, so a reminder that all handouts, certificates, recordings, and any additional resources will be um, emailed to all attendees within the next week. And if you are a call-in listener, please email me at ashley at domesticshelters.org to share um, where we can email those items. So um, Dr. Lewis O'Connor, do you have anything to add to, to wrap up? Um, I was just typing away. I wish you all the best. Um, I also think in the work that you're doing, um, you know, make sure that you take care of yourself. And, and I'm going to ask you just because I have this platform, please make sure people are registered to vote and vote in November.
<laughs> Love it. Yes, yes, absolutely. That is wonderful. Well, everyone, thank you so much for attending. I see some people are, are signing off here now, so we'll go ahead and get wrapped up. If you have any questions for me, it's ashley at domesticshelters.org, and then Dr. Lewis O'Connor's email address is up there if you have any questions for her. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and sign off here. So everyone, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Ashley. Thanks, Thanks. Rita. Nice to meet you, Rita. You too, Annie.